So Sabrina <laughs> Jamans is the author of Chess for Children, and it's a best-selling book. And she's also a women's international master and a businesswoman and entrepreneur. So we're really lucky to have her, her here tonight. And um, she's from the UK. So it's uh, just wonderful to have um, people from all over the world coming to our girls club. So thank you, Sabrina. My pleasure. I am. Um, I love being at these these events. Uh, it's always super fun. The girls are always like got loads of energy. Well, I guess it's not eleven p.m. where you guys are, so that's why you have loads of energy. <laughs> but um, but Bernice, I feel like she, as uh, Sarah's just asked, what time is it over there? I feel like it's like two in the morning or something over there, which is kind of crazy. So. Hope you don't fall asleep during this class. But I thought I'd do the Queen's Gambit decline today because, and I can see someone's have said they play. I saw it come past. I said they play the Queen's Gambit decline. So you may already be an expert on this. But since everyone has been super inspired by Beth Harmon and the Queen's Gambit, I figured that we'd do a bit of a lesson on it. And um, the Queen's Gambit has been really, really popular now. And um, in instead of just doing the Queen's Gambit in general, I thought we'd do the Queen's Gambit declined. And I believe we have a poll, Jen, for the first one, which was like about if we can pick out which one is the, yeah, which is a true Queen's Gambit decline because so many different versions of it and so many different transpositions, which one counts as a real Queen's Gambit declined? Vote now. So for start, um, D45, C4, D take C4 is the opposite. It's the Queen's Gambit accepted. So if you're taking that pawn, you are accepting that free pawn. So therefore that is an accepted Queen's Gambit. Now the other ones are slight tricks. Um, D4, D5, C4, E6, Knight C3, C6, which is option two. That is so close. Um, it's actually technically in that move order called the triangle variation, which we're going to put on a board in a minute. Um, and because it actually like, you know, produces a little triangle. Um, and, you know, it could transpose into some Queen's Gambit decline positions, but isn't actually technically the Queen's Gambit. And the top one looks like the Queen's Gambit. The, the bottom one is the correct answer. But you notice that the top one is slightly different. It's got C6. So I don't know if anyone knows the answer of what that top one is actually called. It's not E6. When I don't play E6, I play C6. Uh, that one is actually called the Slav. Yeah, Jashini and then yeah, well done, Carissa. Everyone who knew what it was, congratulations. Right. So I am gonna bring up a board because I think trying to do it all in person in, in, in um. Um, blindfold blindfold yeah that that would be quite a challenge <laughs> so i'm going to share my screen so like the poll just said we're going to start off with these moves and um, okay so actually this is really the start of it and the thing is with the queen's gambit decline it can get so complicated in terms of like moves and and like the different orders that you play things in so I'm gonna try and and answer people's questions. So I've got the chat up here. Oh, we've got people playing the bot Vinic and stuff like that. There are a lot of theoretical lines in here. So please ask me questions. Um, if you've got any questions, let me know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, can, you, can you tell us about the differences here between playing as white, knight c3, knight f3? and taking on d5, because I feel like that's something that always confuses people. Yeah, so, okay, there are millions of different move orders here. And as Jen just said, you've got knight c3, knight f3, and c takes d5. So let's go with this one first. So this is an exchange variation. And I feel like this is, if you take it this early, this is the people who just want like a really simple game. They're just going to get their pieces out quite nicely. Um, and they're just going to develop and go for something more simplistic. I think it's too early to take for white because one of the biggest, um, biggest problems with this opening is this bishop as black. Like this is always going to be a problem piece with this, this with in this opening because you've basically just blocked it in on move two. 
And so a lot of the strategy behind this opening is that we have to try and find a way we can get this bishop out. And so by playing c takes d5 this early, you kind of let the bishop out straight away and their kind of main plans, um, you know, are, are, are like, it's, it's a, a lot easier for black to play. So I think c takes d5 here is not as good, but the difference between knight f3 and knight c3 is a bit more subtle. I'd say that knight c3 is the most flexible move in this variation because in some of the other lines, again, where they play c takes d5 later, for example, you can actually move your like f3 pawn. Like this is something that people do. Um, and so you, you play like f3 in some lines. And so by playing knight f3, you kind of, you kind of rule those lines out. Also, like we talked about the triangle variation, which is this one where it literally makes a triangle in this particular position. Now by playing knight c3, you've also given yourself another option. So you can actually play the move e4 in this position. So like, this is, a, is another cool thing that people play. I've seen Magnus play this before as well. Like why not try to get control of the center? A lot of theory around that too, which I can go on about, but um, but yeah, like knight f3 and knight c3, they often transpose to the same sort of thing, but this knight c3 reserves the option to be able to do additional other plans. I had a cool question just come through as well, saying what's normally the best diagonal for the light square bishop? That is a really, really good question. So it's really difficult because in a lot of these lines, you want to bring the bishop out, but actually you kind of leave it there for a while until you see where white puts their pieces and then you decide the best square for it. We've actually shown a few times where black tries to bring the bishop out too quickly and they end up with a lot of problems on this b7 square. So people play this queen b3 move and then b7 is vulnerable. And then it's really, really difficult for black to be able to defend and it's not great. Um, so like, I feel like b6 and bishop b7 is often where the, um, the bishop actually ends up in that, in these lines. Um, and we'll talk about that in one moment. So, um, cool. So let's start with some of these, um, some of these lines. So let's, most people will start off with knight c3 and knight f6. And so the main queen's gambit that declined is when you play bishop g5. Now, there are a few different little sidelines that would be cool to show. And in this particular position, um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to start off with, Jen, do you need the polls in order that I gave it to you or can you do them in any order? Any order you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to do the second one now though, because there's, there's so many different variations. And I'm going to bring up the poll which says which of the following lines cannot transpose from the Queen's Gambit decline because I'm going to show you one of the variations now and and so but there's there's lots of different variations that can be played and so I want to see which of these ones you think cannot come from uh, the Queen's Gambit declined. And lots of them can transpose to each other like I said it's a very tricky opening but one of these can't be possible to get to from the queen's gambit declined i'm going to show you this one because it's a good little trick as well there's a good trick coming up with this one all right zoe says she doesn't know what these are so you're you, we're going to give a breakdown the king's indian um you can explain what the different openings are especially the ones that you're going to talk about today i'm going to show all the top three really um and the king's indian was what we were just talking with jen about and just to really, really quickly show it, is when black actually plays the knight out first and they usually just fee and chateau their bishop like this and they put the bishop on g7. So the king's Indian follows that setup, but all the others follow a d4, d5 and e6 setup. So therefore they can transpose from this line. And the reason why I wanted to talk about that now is because um, I wanted to show the Cambridge Springs version first because a lot of people mentioned the Cambridge Springs and I think that's because it's not that well known a line, I don't think. I feel like lots of people don't know what it is or haven't seen it. Give me a hands up if you have seen it before, but I'm going to show it to you. And essentially the Cambridge Spring is where the queen ends up on A5. But I'm going to play a particular move order here because I used to play this trick all the time when I was black. And I played this knight BD7 move 
And and Lara said he loves playing that line. Yeah, I love it. And the correct answer, Sheree, was that the King's Indian was the one that can't transpose. And it looks like that White can just grab this pawn on d5 for free. Um, can anyone tell me what's wrong with grabbing this pawn on d5 for free? So if we take and take, because this knight is pinned, I can just grab this d5 pawn for completely free. Ah, uh, Melina says it, and Trace is free. And uh, someone said c6, but they don't have time to go c6 because it's white's go and they're going to play knight takes d5. But um, yeah, so a lot of people have said that it's a queen sack. It's quite clever. So knight takes d5. And actually, such a bold move. You're playing the move knight takes d5 back. Crazy. And so even after bishop takes d8, Black has the amazing bishop b4 check. Well done, Pori. Well done, Siri. All the people that um, talked about it. It's not Legal's mate. Um, it looks like it, though, because of the, the, the knights and the bishop. It kind of looks like it with the same sort of pieces. I get it. But white can actually block it. Um, it's just that after takes and takes and then takes this guy, if you count the pieces, black has an extra piece. So it's a really cool trick actually. And I used to love playing it. So in this position, if you're black, you can play the move knight bd7. And it's like often opening tricks make you play a weak move, but I love this one because it doesn't make you play a weak move. And it actually just, you know, is a normal good move that you could play in any order. So it's just a little, little trick in that particular order. So I do love that. But to get to the Cambridge Springs, white would just, if they're just playing sensibly, they'd ignore that. They play knight of three and then c6, and this is a typical setup, and then e3. You'll see this is basically a very typical setup, and we will talk about like the semi-slav, if this is, this is also a transposition of, of a semi-slav, similar, um, and then we'll talk about the Tartakova, um, because actually the Tartakova, um, if I go back, would have been here in this line, so Tartakova, is, is when perhaps what black usually throws in this h3, white bishop goes to h4, and then they play this b6 move. This is what we were talking about earlier. We're saying which, which uh, diagonal should the, the bishop go on? And so black decides to play b6 quite early, puts the bishop here, and the idea is that they go c5, and hopefully this bishop then becomes quite a nice big piece later on down the line. It's almost like a king's Indian, but on the other side of the board. So you often see that sometimes. So that's a Tartakova. Um, which, you know, it's, it's similar like that. Um, often they leave the bishop, the knight on b8 in the Tartakova. So when they go c5, they can pop it onto c6 too. But we're not going to look at that. We're going to go back into this Cambridge Springs because after e3, black goes queen a5. So I like this move. And I think Laurel said, yeah, um, that she loves playing this variation. And I think it's quite a good act variation for a queen's gambit declined it's definitely a variation of the queen's gambit declined um it's quite active just because you get your um the queen out of that pin quite quickly most other places play the bishop e7 stuff so this is quite nice and also you know you're threatening to play like this knight e4 move and um and come here and put pressure on the pin piece Yes, Sophia. So knight e4 does come next. And so lots of people play queen c2 here, which is good. You know, you're putting, you're defending the knight on, on c3. Um, you know, you're also putting added pressure on e4. So it's a good move. Um, and then when knight e4 comes, I see a lot of people play the move bishop d3. But this is actually mm. a big blunder. And I want to see if anyone knows why it's a big blunder. It feels so natural. These are exactly the moves that White should be playing. They're just playing it in slightly the wrong move order. And that's why it's really important. But I've seen so many people fall for this. Can anyone tell me why? Knight takes C3. Okay, so you can play Knight takes C3. And you, I guess you're all hoping that White's going to play Queen takes C3. So you can play Bishop B4. Yep, I guess that would be true. But... I think I'd probably play B take C3 and then you don't have that trick anymore. I'm really sorry, guys. But um, what can white black do instead? It's a bit more subtle. Bishop B4 is a good move. I feel like that that is a good move to put pressure on here. Um, yeah, that would... Yeah, that might be pretty good too, because then they can find your move after it. That's what yeah, you're doing. exactly. Right? Yeah. Oh, Ananya has got the I got the right move. So knight takes g five exactly. So the the right move is knight takes g five, and the reason why is because we love to get pieces that are undefended. 
undefended pieces always end up in a tactic somehow and that knight is undefended it feels like nothing can attack it right now but remember where the queen is so this next move d takes c4 well done everyone who's by d takes c4 amazing because now bishop and the knight are attacked and that's another piece of black so I do kind of love the Cambridge Springs because there are two cheeky little piece, sack, uh, piece um, traps that we can get with the Cambridge Springs. And um, so that's kind of why I love that opening. And um, plus, next poll. Another reason why I love the Cambridge Springs because let's uh, we've got a little poll based on my country. In which major city in England has the rival university to Cambridge? So actually in the British Chess League, I played for Cambridge University and I played against this university lots and lots and lots of times. And I think most famous, they battle it, they battle over everything. It's called a varsity match when they battle. And most famous is the boat race. So they have a boat race against each other every year. And usually when we're allowed to go out, everyone everyone goes into London and they go on the Thames. The Thames is the big river in London and they go on the Thames at all different places all around London. So they go North London, East London, all through the Thames and we watch these two universities fight it out in a big boat race. So Yes, they got it right. Um, I know, it makes people know, it's brilliant. So I'm very impressed with you guys' uh, knowledge on the UK. Oxford, Oxford and Cambridge have um, like, I don't know how many years, but a really, 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 really ancient um, rivalry with, um, with, yeah, with everything, with the chess, with um, the boat race, everything. So I like that question. Right, now, back to the main line. Now, most people do play bishop e7. This is kind of where all the main lines come in. And there's lots of transpositions, but I'm not going to show them. I'm going to go straight into the main line. And all of these moves are kind of sensible moves. And you could kind of play it in any sort of move order. And, you know, e3 comes, c6 comes. Oh, actually, maybe like, yeah. So let's play knight, I guess, knight bd7 first. Although I don't think it matters too much. And I think that... Um, like there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion here because one of the main moves that people play is um the, okay so probably what, what i want to say first is yeah someone said like yale and harvard exactly so oxford and cambridge are very much like yale and harvard um so one of the problems like i was saying is that this 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 c8 bishop is tricky to come out and in general you want to trade your pieces when you're you've cramped and you've got no space in the position so to trade the pieces what would you what would you try to do what do you think is an idea to try and do in this position to try and trade the pieces or or in a similar position to this how would you try to trade the pieces and I'm going to play, I'm going to take back knight b7 here because I think a black can play it in this position too. And, you know, I think that often people play h6 first to throw this move in. And I think the idea is that after bishop h4, um, their bishop is not as good on g3 if they want to retreat. c5, yes, yeah, so a c5 is another move I definitely want to try and get in. Um, but the actual variation that most people do is this knight e4 move. Has anyone ever seen this move before? It trades the pieces quite nicely. So now what they're hoping for is that, well, I guess the bishop now has to come and try, come back here. The idea is that now you see we're throwing in an h6 and bishop h4. If the bishop comes back here, this knight can actually grab it. So bishop takes here. Someone says kind of. <laughs> and you often then get a move like queen takes and then they try to get win this pawn, but you can actually take on c3 first. So that's quite nice. Um, and I'm gonna put the poll up about this, this variation. Does anyone know, I don't think the next poll, which grandmaster, well, it's not actually grandmaster, that's why I put, well, it's a debatable whether they're grandmasters actually. What do you think, Jen? Were these people grandmasters or, or not in your eyes? Oh, well, I, I don't think they're, except for one, they're not usually referred to as grandmasters because they have a better title, right? <laughs> well, that, yeah, well, that's it. They're all world, world champions. champion. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, um, but I think there was like a, a kind of um, a thing about this and they, uh, whether there's a debate of whether they were actually officially called grandmasters or not. I think people gave them the title and some people said yes, no. And, and so it was a, it was a, it was a complicated thing. But yes, we've got, again, most people know this stuff, which is really good. Laska was the person who, this is a, called the Laska variation. And this is one of the main lines. And it's able, and you're able to basically swap off two pieces. Um, and yeah, Laska, well done, everyone. So you're able to swap off two pieces. And so often after queen here, queen here, and they take, People think this pawn's really, really weak. So after here, this pawn is attacked. But what's quite nice is that after f5, um, you know, black gets quite a nice position and they can get rid of their double pawn. So right now the double pawns is a bit awkward, but they can get rid of this one quite easily by playing e5. And actually they've kind of got quite a lot of space in the position and actually they can get quite a nice... Um, Oh, someone, someone just said, oh, it's on the top of the screen. Well, no, it is, because actually I put, when you put the variation in at the top, um, chess.com tells you. So whoever spotted that, very, very good. But whoever knew it anyway, that's even better. <laughs> Sneakychess.com puts the answer to everything there. Okay, cool. Right, one more variation, I think, to have. And I think I've got one more poll, which I'll bring up in a minute at the right time. So... Going back to that, that's a good way of trying to swap off your pieces. But let's go to kind of the very raw, like real version of the uh, Queen's Gambit. So the idea, uh, and it's called, like, I guess it's the, one of the main lines. It's called the orthodox variation. And the idea is that you want to still get this bishop out. This is the whole time. And what you're waiting for is this bishop to move. So this light square bishop wants to probably go to d3 because it's a good square for the bishop and it hit it you know it attacks this pawn on h7 so it's a really active square but the idea is that when what as soon as white plays bishop d3 black is going to play the move d takes c4 and essentially they've made white lose a tempo by going to d3 and then to c4 in two moves rather than allowing it to go to c4 in one move and so this is the point they try to try and open up the position and 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 I, by trading a set of pawns and then later they try to trade more pieces which i'm going to come to so black often tries to delay that move and plays like the move rook c1 they try to do everything first that's not bishop d3 because they don't want to don't want to um to allow them to play bishop d6 c4 Question from Shreya, why do you need to trade so much? You don't need to, but if you look at the position, white's got so much more space than black, right? White's got loads more room to maneuver. Um, I feel like it's just much easier for white to play that position. Black's quite cramped. So black, you know, running out of moves now, knight bd7. And it's like, how many more moves do you have left for black to play that isn't either weakening um, or it's just, you know, pointless moves? So, so if you're ever in a position where you're quite cramped, you generally want to trade pieces to make some space for yourself. You look for pawn breaks to swap off pawns and then you try to trade minor pieces. And then by doing that, you create a lot more space yourself in the position and then it just becomes easier to play. So that's why a lot of people try to avoid that Lasker variation because you swap off two sets of pieces. So again here, now, sometimes I'll play people that, you know, so in this position, this is where people play bishop d3. But I've seen some people try to delay it and play like queen c2. They might even play a3. They might even play h3. And they're just desperately trying to play every move on the board that isn't bishop d3 in the hope that you take on c4 and they can, well, not that, you take on c4 and they can take in one move. Um, so in this position, White usually goes bishop d3, this is the main line. And so after d takes c4 and bishop takes c4, the last poll, I believe, Jen, mm -hmm. is what do you think is the best move in this position for black? And I think this is a very difficult question. So I'm hoping there's like a good split between all the questions because this is the main line, the last bit. And what about by playing bishop e2 instead of bishop d3? Yeah, so I think it's pretty much the same thing. So I guess if they take on, if you play bishop e2 and they take on c4, if you don't, you're going to take it back anyway. 
Um, if you don't take it back, you're just a pawn down and they could play B5 and then hold on to that pawn and they're kind of a pawn up. So good question though. I, I totally get what you mean. And there is a there is a quite even split so far. Let's keep voting people. I think it's a good, interesting position. More people vote. I don't think it's, I think you should just guess and see what your in instincts are because I feel like it's a, a tough position and, and I think a lot of moves are good moves in this position. So let's see how accurate you are. I think it's a, a good thing to guess. And the winner is B5. Interesting because I think B5 is a very thematic move and it's a very interesting move. Um, and that's actually one of the main plans in the semi-slav, which is slightly different to this position. Very, very slightly different. And so they go B5. The idea is that when they come back, you actually want to try and get in this B, um, this C5 move. But the problem is at the moment, your pawn's undefended. Um, and if you overextend and play like B4, you end up like allowing this knight to a really good square and then you're never going to get this C5 move in. So people actually want to play A6, Bishop B7 and then C5, but it doesn't quite work because of this knight E4. Maybe you said, what's the difference in the semi-slav? It's this basically, and the semi-slav in these lines, it's usually, the, the moves are a little bit different. The bishop is often on C1 um, in these particular positions where they go B5. So that's the difference. Like. It, in the move orders in the beginning, which we won't cover, but usually the, the, the rook on A1 and the bishop's on C1. And the bishop is a lot less active on C1. And so you can get this idea in. So therefore, that's why it's very, very different. That's why it's very different. But in this position, the best move is actually knight D5. So whoever said knight D5, congratulations, because you picked the right move. And again, it's all because it allows you to trade off more pieces. So... <laughs> So how many people are knight d5? 29%. See, I thought it'd be an even split, you know. I thought it'd be quite even. I think c5 is also interesting, and knight d b6. They're all actually semi-decent moves, and that's why I kind of tricked you. But knight, bishop, knight d5 is the best and main line. The idea, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7. And then if they just trade here, then you're helping them undo their pawns, they can get their bishop out and you're just helping them. So white usually castles um, and then black often then takes on c3 and after rook takes c3, they finally get this e5 moving and you can see that black is finally getting space. And this is like kind of the main moment where like black actually gets to have a nice position. So, you know, this sort of stuff happens. Oh, can't take that, yeah, takes, takes, takes. And look, Black has a bishop that can move. He can get his rooks to the open file. And that bishop is finally free. And you've kind of done your overall get aim to get the bishop outside the pawn chain and the queen's gambit decline. That move that you did on move two or three and trapped him in, you've finally got him free. And this is the moment that you should be very happy if you get this position of the main line of the queen's gambit declined. So that's kind of, I think, a good overview, I believe, on pretty much most lines that there are in the Queen's Gambit decline. So probably one of the most theoretical openings and there are so many different variations.